Welcome to the Think Yourself Healthy podcast, where you meet the intersection of mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Heather Duranja, founder of Nutrition Vixen, registered dietitian, nutritionist, personal trainer, and cognitive behavioral specialist. I'm a mother, author, self-improvement junkie, and recovering perfectionist turned professional half-asser. Each week, I'll be bringing on a guest or a topic that will help you go from surviving to thriving. Are you with me? All right, here we go with today's episode. All right, hello everybody. On today's episode, we have Russ Camarda. Russ has been a professional director, actor, producer, acting coach, cameraman, and editor for the past two decades. In film and theater, he has performed in and directed everything from New York stage to multiple festival award-winning feature films and helped produce them to worldwide distribution. Training and acting techniques ranging from Mesner to method to practical aesthetics, the philosophy of Russ's craft is story before plot and truth above all. There is no right or wrong in art only the truth of the moment. Wow. Well, that's a, that's a lot of accolades. Well, it's not, it sounds really good. <laughs> it sounds, well, it good sounds phenomenal. And that's all that matters, right? Okay. Well, Absolutely. I appreciate you being here with us today, Russ. So say hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on. This is, this is a blast. I couldn't wait to do it. So I'm very excited. Well, I am grateful to have you a part of the Think Yourself Healthy podcast, and I know that today we're going to talk about some really awesome things that are, you know, very much related to how we think and how we respond to certain situations in our life, and when you and I had had a discussion, you had mentioned a lot of different surviving to thriving type of scenarios that you have been faced with throughout your lifetime. So I want to go ahead and just dive right in and talk about how learning the actor's craft of being in the moment and pursuing the objective translates to everyday life. Well, I think uh, the one thing about the actor's craft is, uh, as you said, as you read in my little opening bio there, uh, there's no right or wrong. In other words, um, when you're on stage, when you're in front of a camera, you've hopefully prepared, you've learned your lines, you learned your blocking, you've, you, you understand what your character wants, you have an objective, all those things. That's all your preparation. That's your rehearsal and your, and your prep. But once you get on that stage or in front of that camera opposite another actor, um, you're listening and you're in the moment. And anything that happens uh, in that moment is the truth. And the audience, whether they can really understand it, articulate it, identify it or not, can recognize when there's something dishonest and when there's something honest. Because if you're, if they suddenly catch you acting, you know, the show goes out the window. So you have to be in that moment and trust that all your preparation beforehand is there. You just forget it and you hope it's there. And I think what that, the, the way that translates into life and, and really, you know, a lot of the things you do as far as a health professional is that you, There are so many things you can do to prepare yourself, prepare your body. But once you step out into that world, you know, the truth will find you whether you want it to or not. And you have to behave accordingly. And I think we often get into trouble uh, both on stage and film and in life when we we're trying to hang on or or control that truth Mm. and not flow with it. And that's kind of how it plays with uh, with real life. Absolutely. So as many people have heard me say on multiple podcasts and anyone who personally knows me or has worked with me, one of my favorite sayings is that in life, we can't control the circumstances. However, we can choose how we respond. And so, you know, that's what I'm hearing you say is how this translate is that no matter how much preparation we think we have we can't control what's going on around us, but we can control how we choose to respond to these circumstances. Absolutely. And the truth will set us free. Yeah. And, and really that, that's the, that's the key to um, 
there's a certain thing about when you're as a as a performer as an actor that that you want to be comfortable being uncomfortable mm -hmm. because the the whole situation is uncomfortable and if the if the piece that you're doing is written well most likely it's an uncomfortable thing that this person is has to go through probably the most uncomfortable thing they've ever done in their lives that's otherwise there would be no drama so for you as an actor to be truthful in that moment and be comfortable in that situation and in front of and bearing yourself to the people around you um, there's a certain relaxation that has to be achieved and i think if you apply that to life uh, as most actors the smart ones often do that when we come off if you try and find that philosophy into your life it, you know it reduces inflammation. It reduces <laughs> you know? inflammation. Yeah. I love I mean, your it. Your stress goes down quite a bit if you can accept that. Right. So I recently um, had a situation where I went to an event two weeks ago in Phoenix. I attended this um, amazing event called Event Love that was hosted by Lori Harder and Lindsay Schwartz. And the purpose of it was to hone in our skills as a facilitator so that we can uh, prepare ourselves to host events and really put on you know shows that are really valuable for people based on whatever our genre is and you know obviously mine is specifically working with women who have autoimmune disease cancer survivors anxiety depression um, and the purpose and intent is similar to this podcast just really going from that surviving to thriving type of mindset. So I had to get up on stage and mm -hmm. I had to do my talk, right? And I, I only had two minutes. And so I feel rather comfortable getting up on stage and presenting to an audience. But what really got me was the two minutes. Ah, yeah. Time straight. <laughs> The two minutes, man, I, I got up there and I was like, oh my God, the clock is ticking so <laughs> fast. I tend to have a lot to say and I felt really pressured right. in terms of like trying to calculate how I was going to deliver this dialogue in a very concise manner that was still really effective. Mm -hmm. And so I got up there, I did my thing and it was amazing how initially standing there waiting to go on stage, waiting for them to call my name. I felt the stress response hit the body. My armpits started sweating. You know, I, I started like having that feeling of anxiety, my heart racing. And I'm thinking to myself, am I going to be able to walk down the aisle and take the steps up the stage? <laughs> and literally the second I, so I had a talk with myself. I said, Heather, you've got this. You can do this stepped up on that stage, took a couple of really deep breaths, and then just killed it. Like everything I had hoped to do, I was able to achieve in the short time. And I feel that because I chose, I couldn't control how I was feeling in that moment, but I did choose that I was going to control how I responded to that by cool. breathing through it, talking myself through it, and allowed me to get up there and authentically be me. And so when I was done with the presentation, um, Lori Harder and Lindsay were both like, oh, you've done this like, you know, like this isn't your first mm -hmm. gig. And I kind of I was like, well, honestly, no, I really haven't done a lot of this. And um, I surprised myself. I was like, I am meant to be on stage You're a natural. delivering the message. <laughs> so it felt really good, but it was really a lesson for me that ultimately I do have control of how I can respond. Right. I can't control how my body is going to react in that moment, but I can take control of how I'm going to continue to respond right. in that moment. And that felt really good. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. And, and the, the, the thing we're trained to do is to uh, be comfortable with that always because right. that moment up there is the, the true part of it. Right. You know, you forget everything that you did before and just mm -hmm. trust it'll be there. Right. And that's what you're, you did it naturally and that's yeah. what you want to do you know i have to be honest one of my proudest moments after that whole situation was i chose not to judge how i did yes that's... and that was really big for me was to let go of that judgment piece but what's even funnier is um all of the videos that were recorded while we were doing this you know we were getting little sizzle, sizzle reels 
for some reason they can't find mine. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> mine is the only one missing. So oh, I will no. never be able to relive that moment. That's all right. It'll, it'll play much better in you. In my head, it went amazing. Yeah. Like right. so amazing. <laughs> So I thought that was kind of comical, but I didn't get upset about it. You know, obviously, yes, I would have loved to have the footage so that I could use it for marketing purposes, but I just have to trust in the universe that for whatever reason it disappeared, there was a reason and it is what it is. You know, the other thing, the other uh, thing you mentioned there about judgment and lack of, and not having judgment, the best actors, the best performers, uh, the ones you can't take your eyes off, the Brandos, the, you know what separates them is because when you're when you're doing something like that you did when you're doing a prepared presentation or or really anything anything mm-hmm. in li- any conversation in life but especially in a performance situation there's your there's you doing it but then there's the awareness you have of you doing it so you're sort of judging yourself as you go along mm-hmm. the best ones the best performers minimize that to a degree where they're not judging the last thing they said. So somebody like a Brando from one sentence to the next, he could have he had no care of what he just said. He's just in the moment. Right. And that's the lesson to take to life is to, is to not have that voice, that separate awareness constantly hammering the last thing you said. You right. Know, you be present. You know, it's interesting. I used to judge myself a lot in terms of like when I would speak because I don't, are you familiar with human design? Human design? No. Other than biology? I'll send you a link so that you can take the test or plug in the pieces and determine what what your human design is. Oh, I think I know a little. Yeah. Okay. Definitely do that. So ultimately, you know, I plugged in all the pieces. What it spit out is that I'm what's considered a projector. And so I channel and I have always been the kind of individual where in the moment when I am having a conversation, all of the most beautiful, eloquent things that need to be said flow out of my, my mouth. And apparently I make this tremendous impact on whoever the listener is. And they're always like, could you repeat what you said? And I'm like, uh, (laughs) no. I I have no clue what I just said, like literally no clue. And so for the longest time, I would really judge myself about that. Like, why can't I remember? Why, if you were to type up a script and give me a script and have me try to memorize that, forget about it. It is Mm -hmm. never, ever going to happen. I've really struggled with social media over, you know, the last five years with trying to develop a social media presence and get comfortable in front of the camera because I always felt that I had to have the perfect things to say. So I would not honor what I knew was right for me. And I would try to type up a script, memorize it. Then I'd get in front of the camera and then I would be like, "Uh, uh," you know, it wouldn't flow out. It looked really rehearsed. It didn't feel natural. Then I would judge myself. So I finally had to make the decision that that's just not me. I'm just going to, I am not perfect by any means. I can't pronounce words. I, you know, make funny faces. I'm very animated. I talk with my hands a lot and that's okay. I just, I'm just going to go with it. And once I discovered that I was a projector and understanding that that's part of my human design, it really allowed me to flip that switch and say, oh, okay, this makes total sense. I can let go of that judgment piece and just do what feels right for me moving forward. So- I and you that, and you pronounced my name, so you got that word right. You so, know, I have to admit, I'm pretty damn proud of myself for doing that because <laughs> I butcher things, absolutely butcher them. So, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> way to go, Heather. So, um, so let's talk about overcoming personal loss, fear, and rejection to move forward on your dreams. For me personally, as I just mentioned, I have a lot of big goals. There's a lot of things that I want to do to help make a positive impact in this world. This podcast is one of those, um, you know, medias that I can utilize. I was in resistance. I was in resistance for so long with just doing it. And actually it was the weekend that I met you that I made the decision that this finally needed to happen. Right. And so, um, what are your thoughts on, you know, talk to me about what your thoughts are with all of this. 
Well, I'll tell you, you know, I, I, I mean, like everyone, we all have our stuff that we've had to deal with in our life. You know, uh, when I was young, my father died when I was very young. I was only 11 and, and at that same year moved to a new place. And, you know, so I learned early about loss and about having to overcome things and, 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 and so forth. But um, where it specifically relates to your dreams, I mean, I always wanted to be an actor. I always wanted to be a, a filmmaker. And I did a lot of theater and I did a lot of things in, in New York, but I also had a day job. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like an office manager for a trading firm for a brief bit of time back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And, uh, and I was kind of doing the, the theater when I could and acting when I could and doing films when I could. Um, but I was kind of half in, half out. And uh-huh. like you, I had resistance to, should I do this? Should I not do this? And uh, on September 11th, 2001, that's th- my office was right across the street from uh, the World Trade Center. So that was sort of uh, a key wake-up call uh, for me because I had just got, I was out on vacation. I just came, that was my day back. I just came back that morning. Wow. Um, so I was there, the things I saw, the, 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 you know, everybody knows the story of it. And it was a, it was a tremendous, it left a tremendous mark on me. And it also, one of the things I kept thinking the whole time was, what am I doing down here? I don't, I don't have anything to do with this business. I'm just doing, it's just a job. I needed a job. That's my mm-hmm. day job. I'm an actor. I, you know, I used to leave work at 5.30 at night, go all the way uptown for people who don't know New York from the World Trade Center all the way uptown to to Shakespeare and rehearse till 11 o'clock and then take my train hour ride home, turn around, come back and do it again. And I would do that. So after that moment, uh, it, it, it shook up uh, so many things in everyone in so many people's lives. But for me, it helped kind of I slowly segued myself out of that world and started to do the, uh, I directed my first films. I started writing screenplays and I started doing those things more intensely after that. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, one of the, one of the films I did early on was all about that was about, you know, facing things that are, um, when, when there's something so truthful in you and you deny it, you get physically ill. Yes. And, yes. And though, yeah, exactly. And so those things were were happening to me. I was a bitter, sort of angry fella, you know. And uh, I'd come home on the train, and I, was, I just wasn't wasn't pleasant to you know to my then wife. And not you know that we had a great marriage, but it was it was uh, I pro- I'm sure I was not a, a, a happy fella mm-hmm. when I worked in that environment, and it led to you know all kinds of um, health stuff and and once I was able to kind of change my mind on that, it's amazing how, what that does to your soul and your body and, and all those things. So I, I, I've, I've done productions and written about that since then, because it's, it's really been a difference for me. I want to go back mm-hmm. to where you are physically manifesting symptoms in your right. body. Sure. Do you remember what that felt like? What, what it felt like, like, what did your every day, what was well, every I day had, like for you I at can that tell time? You, yeah. Well, that, that particular time was, I, you know, I had, I had no energy. Um, and I'll go, I'll go back even further um, where I really saw it. Because uh, it, it, it definitely affected me in that time period. But I, w- I was already prepared for what was happening to me. Because when I was young, when I was in high school, um, I was the president of my class and I had an unbelievable year, you know, this amazing transformative thing where I, I kind of came out of nowhere, had long hair, you know, I didn't look like that. The, you know, I was the typical kind of, you know, smoking grass or weed on the, on the handball courts type guy, but I, but but I sounded like this. (laughs) So I sounded like this in that body at 16 and I, and I became sort of this, I never was a thought of myself as a leader at that moment, Mm -hmm. but I turned around and realized that people were following me. And once I knew that that's what my character was, uh, I I eventually became the president of class. We turned a whole community around. It was a very, very big year for me. Mm -hmm. It was real big for an 18 year old. A lot of great things happened, but when it was over, um, when it was over, I, I went into a huge depression because that was gone. 
And right. I, I didn't go on to college. I went to acting school and stuff, but I, it wasn't, and it left me with mono and like all, um, uh, some other thing, uh, uh, right on top of one thing on top of another bronchitis, what, which left me with a horrible asthma, which I'd never had. Mm. And it was clear that that was a physical manifestation of my, you know, depression and, and, and the dip from that. So every time I've run into those challenges through my life, I know where they come from. And then I know where to go back to, to fix it. So how does a 18, 19 year old young man have the clarity to understand that what was going on with him physically was a result of not, not honoring their purpose, what they're supposed to be doing? Well, I'd like to say it was some, I was some you know brilliant genius or something, but I think it was just literally it was so obvious. It was the proximity to my emotional state mm-hmm. and how soon it manifested right after that. It's like, well, this didn't just come out of nowhere. Well, I, I find it really fascinating that you at such a young age were able to have that kind of clarity because personally, I feel especially working with clients whom are suffering from such, you know, traumatic things, majority being autoimmune diseases, which autoimmune disease, typically they don't know why there's this just mystery behind it. Right. Well, we don't know why you got this. You just do. And most people attach themselves to those diagnoses and they just, that's it. This is what this is what they are accepting of how their life is going to be. They set all of their hopes and dreams aside and they say, I'm sick. Mm -hmm. I have this autoimmune disease or I have cancer or I have whatever. I have depression, anxiety, and it is what it is. And then Mm -hmm. they never are able to take action to start living the best life, you know, the Mm -hmm. kind of quality life that they desire. I personally feel that most people are so detached from themselves that they can't make the correlation that what's happening with them physically is a result of what's going on in their thoughts. Right. Well, I mean, there's a great uh, statement that when the, when the soul suffers, the body cries out. Yeah. And, uh, and what you said is, you know, there's, there's you and then there there's there's the that you know that frontal lobe ego present sort of in the in the physical world you but there is an awareness mm-hmm. that you are that is really you right so when you said they say i am sick i am this i am they're just attaching who they are to that exactly where if they could take that remove that attachment and say i am healthy. I am strong. I am, th- you know, there's a big, that, that's a big shift. It's, Absolutely. it's, a, you have to really buy into it and, and understand it. And, and, and uh, it has to resonate so truthfully to you. Mm-hmm. But once you do that, I think you make big progress in your physical presence. Absolutely. When I was 18 years old and got diagnosed with, you know, an autoimmune kidney disease and got kicked off my parents' health insurance and couldn't get health insurance for having a pre-existing condition. It was really frightening because I knew that I was sick. Mm -hmm. And after the birth of my first daughter, they told me I was looking at dialysis or transplant within five years. Wow. And I decided, no way, (laughs) not for me. Uh Uh-uh. I'm healthy. I'm happy. I'm vibrant. I'm going to have longevity. I'm going to have vitality. I'm going to figure this out. And that was the, the defining moment in my life where I really knew I had control. Right. I actually had control, right. but it started with how I thought about the disease that was living within me. Absolutely. And so most people I feel that they are so attached to this identity that the fear of letting go of the identity for the unknown, that healthy version of themselves is so frightening that they choose to hold on to what they know. Right. right? Well, I mean, and, and it doesn't have to be sort of esoteric, uh, ethereal. I mean, it, it's science. Mm-hmm. that the placebo effect is a real thing right 
You know, if, if you give a, a, a sugar pill and tell somebody that it's going to cure them and they believe it and they don't know it's a sugar pill and it's a placebo and they get well, well, how did that happen? Right. It started in their mind and, it, and your mind is that your body is a manifestation of your mind. Right. You know, you're, you're just a physical manifestation of something uh, unquantifiable, unreadable. So if you can change that, then you change the physical stuff. So, and that's science. That's real, right. you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't be more excited to be having this conversation with you <laughs> because ultimately that's the whole purpose of why I started this podcast is to get people thinking about a new approach when it comes to their overall health and well-being. We've been told for so long that you got to do it this way. We're not seeing the results. Something's got to change. Right. And I know for myself that it took me to think differently about how I was going to get healthy in order to actually achieve that health. And I have gained 25 quality years on mm -hmm. my life. I mean, yeah. you know, I have a 23 year old and we joke all the time because I feel 23. I'm like, how are we the same age? And she's like, Come Bob, on, get over no, yourself. That's not real. That's not true. You know, that's right. Get over true. yourself. <laughs> but the reality is, is that I, I, I feel like I'm reverse aging. Literally. Right. I am, I really embrace the child in me. <laughs> And I love for her to come out and play. She comes out and plays all the time. I sometimes, you know, get judged and I'll be like, oh, whatever, and I'll do it again. <laughs> right. But um, I really feel that that is a vital component to my health and well-being is being able to honor that inner child, let her have fun, let her have freedom and play in a way that elicits all of my dreams. And, you know, I go back to that little girl who played Annie every single day in her room and sang her heart out, right. you know? Um, and I, and I do, I feel like that we all could benefit from allowing ourselves to act in that manner. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll tell you that, that talk about truth that I, I taught acting for a while. And the one thing I wouldn't do is children's teach children because it becomes more like improv games and you're, and, and I was more, that wasn't my thing. I was more teaching adults. But the, the point is they already knew how to do it. Right. They had no baggage to shake off. You told them, you know, they were Batman and they believe they're all in, you know, right. nothing but truth. So that's, that's the beautiful, but that's what happens is as you get older, you get more rooted, you get closer and closer to this physical, you're, you're just, your perception of this world is all you have, Right. but it's a lie. It's completely, I mean, if your perception was the truth, you know, looking at you stereoscopically through two eyes, you'd be upside down and back. Like your brain is creating the world. Right. It's not really what's here. So, and kids, you know, don't know that until they get older. So that's where the truth is. And mm -hmm. if you, everything that you see around you, these microphones, this, what started with a thought. Mm-hmm something that didn't exist. It was just a thought. It was a, it was a picture in someone's mind, an imagined thought. That's real. That's a real tangible thing. And it becomes a physical manifestation and we're no different. So health is the same way. I think, I think if you can look at your body and look at the way you did and say, I'm, I'm not going to do, I'm this, right. You become that. So take me back to that time when mm -hmm. after, you know, 9-11 and you're presenting all of these physical symptoms, you're not feeling in alignment with who you wanted to be. What, what was the thing that allowed you to change your mind and choose differently? Well, I, that's a good question. I've never really thought about what the actual trigger was at that moment, but um, I've always had, and I'm, I'm slowly getting better at this now, but I've always had this sort of clock in my mind. Okay. about I, there's certain things I want to say before I check out, mm -hmm. you know, and I hadn't said them. I still haven't said a lot of them, and, but I'm better at dealing with that clock. But that was really ticking. And that day really, it was like, you know, it's five to midnight, pal. You know, if you got to say this now, because look how close it can be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I think it was, it was a feeling of, um, running out of time, whether that was warranted or not. And, okay. and I immediate, and the first thing I did 
I, I, I wanted to do this feature film and I was looking for scripts and a friend of mine had written a play and it was about, it, the plot was something different, but the story underneath that plot was about that, was about not denying the truth of who you really are because it, it crushes your soul. And I was like, well, there, that's it. That's exactly what I want to say. So it was a combination of that event, making mm-hmm. the time seem short and right. the particular piece of work that came across my way. And once I did that, then I was off and running. That's awesome. I, I love that you were able to tap into seeing the value behind needing to m- take immediate action. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's been many different times throughout my short life that I have been in those circumstances. And every time that I have chosen to trust my gut has always been the most rewarding, you know, where fear is staring me straight in the face. And I'm thinking there is no way in hell. All of the odds are stacked against me. I've got everyone telling me you're crazy. You can't do that. And my gut is saying, yes, you can. Yes, you can just trust. And every time that I've chosen to trust, that's when, you know, I align with purpose. I feel the most fulfilled. All of the amazing things happen. I think there's this misconception. Life is just full of journey and learning lessons. And as a human species, we, we think everything is supposed to be perfect. And we were sent here to learn specific lessons. And when we create this idea that everything is supposed to go to a certain, you know, according to plan, and when it doesn't go according to plan, we freak out, we let the ego get involved, we stay in that place of fear that stops us from continuing to take action and we submit, we Oh, it's just not for me. You know, I really feel like I am in that 1% of the population who will never stop. I will keep going until I have fulfilled my mission. And my mission is trying to spread the message, you know, around this whole concept that we can be anything we want to be. We just have to choose differently about the approach. It all begins with our mindset. Right. And, and, and there's a, you know, there's a specific order that I think people get backwards sometimes, and that's what throws people off and because it's frightening. Mm-hmm. And there's a favorite quote I used to put on as a tagline to all my emails. It's one of my favorite quotes, and it's, be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. But you have to do it in that order. You have to be bold first. Right. Then the mighty forces come to your aid. You can't have a bunch of mighty forces so you can be bold. You have to, you have to be brave and the universe rewards that. So it's the physical action of moving through life that creates the opportunity and the waves of energy. And so people, they get caught up in the fear of taking the action, but it's Mm -hmm. like, if you, if you did that, the reward is on the other side of it, you know, it, it finds you. So what is one of the boldest things that you have chosen to do? Oh gosh. (laughs) Um, Oh, I'm, you know, I've, 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 I've made a lot of crazy decisions where I, where I, 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 uh, I, I suffered for them, but I, but some of the, you know, I mean, I remember, you know, when I, when I was, a, when I first got married, when I was a kid, I mean, I had no job. I had no, I, I had a, you know, $7 an hour job and, and I went out and, and spent money. I didn't have to get a ring and just knowing that eventually that would work out. It turned into a nice long relationship that, that was like 19 years it, it ended, but it was, it was wonderful. But I took mm-hmm. a chance when I was a kid um, that I shouldn't have. Right. Uh, just knowing According that. According to them. Yeah, you know, you just, <laughs> um, so many things in, 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 in my, uh, you know, the first films I did, I really didn't know. I went into it not knowing what the hell I was doing mm-hmm. and laying down a lot of money I didn't have again. And, credit cards and things to get just to hope that you would get something accomplished and, and those things got accomplished. So those things have always been my, now I'm not by any means the, um, the, the prime example of the practitioner of this. Uh, I have to remind (laughs) myself 
that's and why that's I'm okay. glad I'm talking to you right now yeah. because I'm hearing myself saying, yeah, you kind of, you should kind of maybe get back to doing well, that. Well, maybe again. this was the universe's little nudge for you I'm sure. to uh, I'm practice sure. what we preach, right? It exactly. happens to me all the time, having conversations with people and being able to so clearly see exactly what it is that they need. And then after I verbalize it and I think about it and I'm like, ooh, okay, maybe I need to take a little bit of my own advice. And that's okay. That's part of the human experience. It's reminders, right? That there's always room for growth, but we get so stuck in that judgment piece that it literally paralyzes us from being able to choose differently. I know that um, one of my bravest moments I'd like to share with you Please. was when I decided to um, make the decision to move out of the Midwest. So I had spent my entire life living in the Midwest. I, you know, I'm the oldest. I have a lot of Where? brothers. Where are you, where are you from? I'm from St. Louis, so Missouri. And um, so I was going to be turning 40 and I'm reflecting on my life thinking, you know, this isn't really what I pictured. This isn't how I thought I was going to feel. And at the time, um, my oldest daughter was having a lot of, um, she was in a really bad place. She was in a bad relationship. A lot of things were happening in her life that were pretty much indicating that I knew where things potentially were going to go for her and it didn't look very promising. And that really scared me as a mother. I didn't want that for her. But I also wasn't in a place where I was living authentic, authentically with how I wanted to live. And so I decided that we needed to move away. Why are we here? Oh, because I was told this is what I needed to do, right? You just grow up with sure. these conditionings that you stay close to your family, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking about the big picture and I'm like, well, we only see our, each other on major holidays, Why? Right? We live 10 miles away from each other. Like this just doesn't make sense. So anyway, I decided that I was going to leave California last because I didn't want to be biased. I had a feeling I was going to like it, but I wanted to make sure everything had a fair opportunity. So I took a couple of months, went to all the different markets that were known for health and wellness. And um, everyone told me, fly into San Diego. You're going to feel it. You're going to love it. So I did exactly that, landed, got out, didn't feel it. Didn't feel I it. was devastated. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And so I rented a car and I started driving up the coast, hopeless. And at the second I rounded the corner into, in between Dana Point and Laguna, that feeling that I had been waiting for struck me so hard. It was so undeniable. And I knew right in that moment that this is exactly where I was supposed to be. So I pulled over, I texted my daughter and I texted my best friend and I said, we're moving to California. And they were like, okay. And they just trusted <laughs> me. Right. So then I got a little scared. I'm like, oh shit, how am I going to work this All out? Right. So I flew back to St. Louis I had two contracts on the table. One of them was for a local TV show, which ultimately it's a dream of mine to be able to host my own health and wellness TV show and have a platform to be able to have these kind of conversations. And the other one was an exclusive contract with a really high end health and wellness um, facility. So I knew that if I signed those contracts, I was going to be getting myself into a situation where I would have financial security and then I'd be trapped. Uh. And so I had to be honest with myself. Is this really what I want? Is financial security ultimately what I'm seeking? Hell no, no way. So I chose to trust. I sold everything I owned, packed my car up, Three weeks later, my daughter and I got in that car and we drove 27 hours wow. straight to the coast. Wow. I had no job. My clients didn't want to come with me in terms of like transitioning from in person to virtual. That was really scary. They had only worked with me in person. They thought mm -hmm. they needed Heather. <laughs> and so I didn't have clients. I didn't have a job. I had nowhere to live. I had no idea how all of this was going to work out. And I had about $500 in my pocket. 
Wow. And I went from the Midwest to the one of the more expensive places to oh, live yeah. in the U.S., oh, right? Yeah. Everyone is like, you are crazy. <laughs> and I'm like, no, what's crazy is for me not to trust my gut and right. do what I feel is necessary. And as I reflect back on that decision and I think about it, I let go of fear. I let go of judging how it was all going to work out. And within a matter of weeks, everything fell into place. I had a girlfriend who happened to be out here. She let me stay with her until I was able to secure a place to live. I found a job. I was able to walk to work from where I was living so my daughter could use the car to get a job right. for herself. And things weren't perfect by any means, right. but it worked out so that we could continue to keep evolving and now my daughter is literally living her best life. The girl is a rock oh. star. She's living her dream. I'm so happy. But I had to trust. I had yeah. to trust my gut. Yeah. And the, the, the byproduct of that is, you know, we're talking about individual, you know, living your truth and, 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 uh, and not denying the truths inside you by being bold. But you forget that it's not just you. Right. Look at the effect, you know, that how, you know, what a mom you are now to do that. Now she's got this, this life that, that wasn't possible because you took a bold act that was not just for you. It, it's, it resonated all around you. And that, and that happens, that could happen with small things and everybody in your life. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a lesson to learn. It's really, really impressive. Let right. me ask you this question. What was the point? Once, you know, you settled in, you, you were staying with somebody, but then you got the job. What was the point that, or was there a point where you went, good move? Or was it, it was right pretty off the immediate. Bat? Pretty immediate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It was pretty immediate because I really trusted that this was exactly where I needed to be. And so I was so confident in my decision that not only did I bring myself out here, but I brought my daughter and then I brought out my best friend who was my, you know, who works as at the time she was an assistant. Now she's an operations manager. And I ended up bringing out a, she's my first cousin, but she's more like a niece to me. Mm. And so over time I've been able to just continue to, you know, I, I like to help them see a different way. But Absolutely. now all of these young ladies are literally living their best life. And I just trusted, I knew that this is exactly what needed to happen. And one of the, you know, I'm, I, I have full disclosure, one of the most challenging decisions that I had to make in that process is that my younger daughter, whom was getting ready to go into high school, did not want to move. She did not want, she wanted to stay there. She wanted to be with her friends, stay, you know, do high school. And so I had to make the decision to leave her behind. Mm. And that was a really hard wow. thing to do because I knew that there was going to be a lot of judgment on my part from other people, sure. specifically mothers. How could you do that? You know, how, how dare you? Um, but I, I, I trusted this is what she wanted. I felt that she was going to be in a safe environment and um, it forced her and I to have to learn how to develop a different kind of relationship. And right. through the heartaches and the struggles that we did experience over the first two years of that transition, it allowed us to figure out how we needed to communicate to form a healthy relationship. Right. And now we have such a healthy relationship. She's still in the Midwest. She's in college, but she's planning to transfer after her sophomore year. She's in school for marketing and graphic design. She's just a little badass. She's going to be <laughs> an amazing businesswoman. She's already started her own business. And I know that she's going to be very successful. That's amazing. But, you know, again, that would have been something that would have held a lot of people back from making that choice out of fear. Sure. And I Especially just had to trust. Without uh, uh, stereotyping gender roles, especially for a woman. Right. That's a, that's a, that's a lot of judgment going to be thrown at you. Uh, but you, you did the right thing. And it's amazing that that right. worked out. Right. So it feels good to be able to get them all together and we reflect and say, what if we wouldn't have done right, that? Like, right, where yeah. the hell would we be right now? Like, <laughs> what would life be? We joke about it all the time, you know, but um, 
It feels good. And oh, you'd probably have a TV show in St. Louis or something. Who knows? Yeah, but you know, I said to my someone like you, the expression of that truth isn't going to like that. You have no choice. Like it'll find its way out. You know, you you did the the moves you made, but it would have found its way out. Right. Well, the you know, and at that time, I said to myself, if I can make these things happen here in the Midwest, I can make them happen anywhere. Yep. Exactly. So, so to the listeners out there, what is your piece of advice to them? How, how, how can they trust in themselves and find that truth? Tr- tap into that actor inside, that uh, authentic person that they're supposed to be. What would you say to them? Well, I mean, I know it can be scary uh, t- to do that, but I would start like anything. Uh, you know, when you get a 110 page script, and you have a lead role, and you're you're in two thirds of it. You start with one line at a time. You learn. You, you find your action. You find you 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 eat the pizza one piece, the little pieces at a time. Mm-hmm. So for that to be bold, start with things that you can measure. You know, take those actions that are a little scary. Then you know maybe maybe you're not ready to to move to California with five hundred dollars in your pocket, but if you can. Start being aware of being aware. Just kind of step back on yourself and look at it almost like you're in a show, like you're the actor in the show. The actor in the show, um, he's not Hamlet. He's playing Hamlet. So he's as truthful as he can be while he's Hamlet. But there is that awareness of where to stand. There is an actor there controlling that robot, you know, that character. So start getting used to doing that, being aware of your of your stuff and and test with little steps, little bold steps that you normally wouldn't take and watch the universe reward you for it. And then once you get evidence, well, Mm. now you could pack up your car and, you know, Mm. move to Laguna. (laughs) I love that. I love the fact that you said evidence because ultimately we are constantly seeking evidence to justify our actions, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And so when most people are seeking the wrong kind of evidence, right? I don't know if we have time to go into that whole story of how I was able to have the self-discovery of the evidence I had been seeking to justify that I was unworthy and deserving of certain things in my life, especially having healthy relationships with men. I had a lot of deeply rooted abandonment and rejection issues And through them, subconsciously, I sought out emotionally unavailable men to justify that I wasn't worthy and deserving of love. So the evidence is always out there. It's just our choice to decide what evidence we choose to believe. Right. And that's why awareness to me is the self-awareness is is the step to self-actualization. It's stepping away from understanding this is a show you're in this play but you're not the character in it you are it's you're participating in it so step back and and start to see the patterns and things and again i say this like you know uh, it's it's the truth written in stone but i'm i'm not the best practitioner of it I'm, i'm as good as anybody else is but it always is good to take that moment to be aware of of what's happening and once you do that you start to recognize patterns around you and then you can better navigate it right i love it it's kind of like what jen gottlieb always says you don't have to fully believe but you just have to believe a little bit more that's right just a little bit more and then all of the sudden you start to really believe i love it so tell me where can we find you what's next for you what do you have going on what's up your sleeve oh Nothing up my sleeves. Uh, well, I have, uh, I'm, I'm, like I said, I spoke to you beforehand. This is the, my slow time. I, I'm a, I'm a full time. I have a production. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of like a, a production for hire, a, a gun for hire, a cinematographer, a videographer. I do. And, and I'm still an actor and, and, and writer and director and all that stuff. So I'm doing a short film right now with a partner of mine. We're wrapping shooting in a, in a few days. Um, I'm working on a screenplay and hopefully in the next uh, few months, once I get all my stuff laid out here, I'm going to start my uh, podcast myself um, called 
Art Craft Truth and uh, ACT, A-C-T, Art Craft Truth. Oh, I so like that. That'll be out in the next few months and, and it'll be just interviewing artists, but not sort of like uh, the, the whole thrust of it isn't so much anecdotes about career like you like most interviews with artists are it's to get to the it's almost like inside the actor studio kind of an idea mm -hmm. but with every kind of artist from comedians to uh, musicians to because i i'm always fascinated by how craftsmen do their craft like how and everybody's different and have different methods so that's going to be the thrust of that so look for art craft truth in your podcast menu okay. down the, down the road but I That's love it. Well, as soon as you have that ready, make sure you let me know so that I can share it with the audience and they can go check it out. It sounds like there's going to be a lot of good stuff on there. Absolutely. So that's exciting. I can't wait for you to take this bold move by creating this podcast. Yes. I'm, I'm stepping off the ledge. Yes. I love it. Uh, venture. So that'll be fun. Yeah. I, I know for myself, one of the biggest fears around actually taking action to make the podcast happen was I was scared to death that whatever I said, I was going to be held accountable to. And I was <laughs> so scared of that piece. But for some reason, I just knew that I had to do it, that I wasn't serving the greater good by staying silent. Mm -hmm. And not everyone's always going to agree with the concepts, the theories, you know, the, the facts, whatever, mm -hmm. the ideals. And that's okay. They don't have to. But I know that there's a lot of people out there who need to hear this kind of conversation um, in order to get them thinking differently. Absolutely. And, and for third-party endorsement from me, just getting your spirit the, the brief time we met and through this podcast, I can tell you that you're, you're on the right. You did the right oh, thing. You should be you. getting the word out there and do what you do. So keep thank doing you. it. I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate all your support and I look forward to supporting you and your new efforts. So keep Excellent. me updated on all of that. And if there's anything else coming up, make sure you reach out and let me know. And hopefully uh, all, you'll start taking your advice and doing those things. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for spending this time with me on the Think Yourself Healthy podcast. I'm so grateful that you stopped by. If you could just take a minute to share this episode with someone you think who would love it, it would be amazing. Take a screenshot that you've listened to the episode and tag at Think Yourself Healthy and myself at Nutrition Vixen so that I can share it. Leave a review on iTunes to let us know how much you loved being here and what you want to hear next. Until next time, don't forget to think yourself healthy. Thanks again, guys. Bye.